I'm Gillian Bell from Walkworth, um, three school years from 10, been in this form, um, with the course for 20 years, and I'm finding at this third stage in my life, it is letting go that mother quality that wants to have children happy, because I realise that that is still holding me back in form. This is my interpretation, and I'm really throwing it open to see if other people have another interpretation. Um, I can sort of relate to the guy in the Old Testament who was asked to kill his son. Was it Abraham or something? I believe that was metaphorical as much as anything. Um, I guess it, the lesson behind the experience is hand over. When I got into strife about 18 months ago with anguish for the state that both my kids seem to be in in their 40s, um, the message I got was, you trust me with your life, why don't you trust me with your children's lives? And I, I suspect that that is it, but I have this special relationship as a mother with two children. I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on that, please. Yes. Well, it reminds me of that passage in the Bible, you know, where the, the, all the apostles are around and, uh, and Jesus' mother, Mary, is coming up and, and uh, you know, they're trying to make a big deal about Mary uh, coming up to the scene. And, and basically he says, uh, who is my father, mother, sister, brother? As he looks around the whole audience. You know, he that does the will of our Father in Heaven is our father, mother, sister, brother. So, yeah, if you're coming into a state of mind where your your mind is opening to transcend all special relationships so that you have this sense of unconditional love, agape love, that you can love any person in any uh, culture, in any tradition, just as much and as dearly as you love uh, your own children. And I think what happens a lot of times when we start to move into that, there's a lot of there could be a lot of resistance to that, but the most helpful way to think of it is, is that you're not um, devaluing your children in any way. You're just including the rest of the universe in with them. So this awakening to the present moment is really an inclusive uh, movement where you're saying, ah, I love you and I uh, am going to embrace everyone with the same love. And those roles, uh, that the mother-daughter roles or the mother-son roles that, that come in when you, when you feel, still feel a little bit of a tightness or something there or, or something that's restricting, those are still uh, concepts from the past. That, yes, they're still, uh, you might say that all roles um, that involve personal relationships and interpersonal relationships are, were set up by the ego to reinforce guilt. So it's as if, you know, you you seem to come to this world and deal out, uh, you know, parents and siblings and children and people in your environment. Um, and the ego is doing the dealing, and that's why uh, relationships in this world have such guilt with them. Because it seems like these patterns of guilt just play out over and over. Expectations uh, that were not met, um, either toward projected on parents or children or siblings or priests and nuns and so on and so forth. It goes on and on. And when you get into the holy instant, what you start to see is all those roles and, and all those expectations that go with those roles are getting gently washed away by the Spirit. All roles in this world are, are like concepts that the mind identifies with. And then you might say that they're ego ideals. So let's say you're identified with the mother concept. How good is a good enough mother? And how much guilt uh, comes in when, when you try to measure up uh, with other mothers or with, with a standard that you have in mind? So you see that the, the idea of being a mother is, a, is an ideal, an ego, ego ideal, and that you never can uh, quite fully reach perfection with it. You know, it's all, there's always... Uh, not good enough, uh, could have done better. Uh, and it's the same with the father role. It's the same with roles. Uh, people do it with spirituality too, where they take on a, a role and they feel like they fail. They don't live up to the role. So as you go deeper in your mind and as you go deeper within, uh, the Holy Spirit or the, the intuitive self, the higher power, slowly loosens your mind from these roles. 
And you might say that before you wake up from the dream of this world, your final role is forgiveness. But it's a very broad uh, concept. It's so big that it encompasses the whole world. It's like a giant blanket of love that just spreads over the whole world and you can take everybody in your mind and realize that everybody is included in you and that everybody lives in your heart. The Course is a very, very powerful tool. And so, a lot of times it's not unusual for people to have A Course in Miracles as their spiritual path and have it for years and years and years. Uh, the guidance of how you work with it may seem to change over the years. Um, you may do the workbook for a number of times and then uh, be guided to kind of pop open the workbook or the book, more like an I Ching uh, kind of a thing where you're pretty well in touch with the Holy Spirit, but occasionally you reach some stuck spots where you're a little turned around and confused and you need an answer. And so you just close your eyes and formulate your prayer. Really just a prayer of help. Uh, bring some clarity and then uh, many times people can pop open uh, the book that way and use it that way. Um, sometimes in the early years with the course people will attend study groups and they will be <coughs> quite structured and disciplined and that all has its place too in the sense that it's kind of like the 12 step program. If, if an addict is coming in and they have a completely chaotic life, a little bit of structure is good if you have uh, chaos in your life, if you're just scattered. And it's the same with the Course in Miracles. It's, it's not assuming that you have a highly trained mind when you begin doing those work with lessons. It's actually assuming that your mind is not trained. And so Jesus and the Holy Spirit are going to like take you into the waiting pool first and slowly take you in and slowly ask a little bit more of you as far as the practice periods and take you in and, and let that discipline grow as you build confidence uh, with working with your higher power, working with intuition. So, uh, it's, it's also very important to be very gentle with yourself. The ego will try to interpret against the Course and interpret against uh, many different things on the spiritual journey with like uh, one defense me mechanism is perfectionism. Uh, some people do the workbook and they, they'll do so many lessons and say, I'm not doing it right, I'm not doing it good enough, I'm just going to stop doing it or start over on lesson one. And this could be a common ego tactic uh, to have, reach a certain point, go back to one, reach a certain point, go back to number one. You should remember when you're doing the text and when you're doing the workbook to just be gentle with yourself and stay open to those next lessons and know that uh, you're going to forget practice periods, you're going to make mistakes, but don't, uh, like they do at banks where they compound the interest, uh, don't compound the mistakes uh, by thinking, by beating yourself up. Uh, oh, I, I messed up, so therefore I, I, I'm a failure at this, or I'm not going to be able to do this. Because that's what the ego wants you to do. It wants you to conclude that you're not going to be able to do it. But you are. You know, you, you are going to succeed in this. And uh, it just takes faith and being gentle with yourself. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And basically, uh, it's the same thing in Eastern uh, philosophy, they call it Maya. Uh, maya is another word for illusion. And that you might say that this entire perceptual world is an illusion. Now to the mind that seems to be dreaming it and, and perceiving it, it does not appear to be an illusion. It appears to that mind to be reality. And so because it appears to be real, it's like you find yourself uh, asleep and reacting and responding to the images as if there are real people there uh, doing real things and real activities occurring. And um, initially there's not an awareness that, that it's just a dream, uh, no different than your nighttime dreams, you know, when you can be lying at home, safely sleeping in bed and going through all these emotional reactions as your mind is generating this dream, nighttime dream. Uh, but, but what seems to be the daily world, this daily world of, of this room and all the bodies and everything, th this is a dream as well. And um, you, you begin to get a little bit of sense as you work with the Course of the dreamlike dream -like quality of it. Because the more detached you become and the more deeply you go into your mind, you, you have a, a 
feeling like you're you're just dreaming a dream, or like you're the observer, both in quantum physics, um, if you're the observer of the whole thing, and that an important step towards coming to this is that same lesson 132, Jesus says, there is no world apart from what you think. So you have to start to realize that the world and your thoughts are really identical. Even though all of us have been trained to believe that we have these little thoughts whirling around in our minds, and then that there's this massive cosmos that's out there, and they don't seem to have any direct connection. You know, most people think, well, my thoughts certainly are not uh, influencing uh, the whole universe. Uh, and that's part of devaluing and uh, believing that your thoughts have no power. And that's part of the dream world. But the more you go deeper in, you start to realize that that the thoughts that you think you think and the world that you think you see are actually identical. So whatever you're thinking about, your mind is so powerful that it's producing the entire cosmos. Uh, the planets, the stars, the spheres. Um, we have a, a movie that we'll probably be showing. There's a lot of gradations and level in that twisted perception. And it's not very happy either uh, because it's a judgment. It's saying that some are ahead and some are behind. So if you continue to work with the course, you'll reach a state of mind that's inevitable where you start to see the sameness of all things. Let all things be exactly as they are. That's the way the work book says it. And, you know, you just, initially, you seem to go through a phase where you're tempted to project or blame somebody or something, or blame the environment, blame the government, blame the president or the prime minister, blame the, the scientist or the ozone layer or the somebody, something. You draw it back in your mind and you realize that, that it was just a mistaken belief, that really it was the belief in separation that was really the thorn, the thorn in the side, so to speak, or the, the little speck in the eye that was causing all this crazy world. And then when you release that little speck from within, then everything is perceived as the same. You see the big picture. You see the whole tapestry. You don't try to pull anything out from it. So, yeah, there is there is one more step beyond the happy dream. And the Course says God will take the final step. And then it goes on to say that God doesn't take steps. <laughs> but, but, the, but the final step was actually the first step, so to speak. When we were created, we were created perfect. And so the final step is nothing more than remembering your own perfection. Uh, it's not like this thing that has to occur in the future. It's just kind of going back in, like, yeah, you're going backwards to the point. Yeah. I always had the image of like, um, like you land on a beach and you you make tracks all over the beach since we're here in New Zealand. You've got a lot of beaches, you know. You make all these tracks, and then at some point, you, it's like getting a broom and starting to step backwards and and cleaning the beach. <laughs> and wiping away all the tracks until you get to a point where you've kind of wiped away all the tracks. And all that's left is this pristine beach. It's got no tracks or indentations left on it. And then you get lifted up <laughs> uh, at that point. And that's, that's more of an idea that time really goes backwards instead of forwards. That really you're just starting to unlearn all the errors and mistakes that you thought you had. And then when you're done unlearning this, you are what you've always been. One for the Son of God. Yes, the one for the Son of God. Mm -hmm. And that's a blazing light experience. Uh, uh, who you are, some of you might have read the literature on what they call them near death experiences, where they, I call them near life experiences, because they, you, that light is, is what life is. And when they go into the light, you know, they know everything, and it's all telepathic, and, and they know all the wisdom of the universe, and it's, the words fail. That light is, is who we are. That is the light of, of Christ, you might say, or the Holy Son of God, or whatever terminology you'd like. So, when you go deep in your mind and you learn to forgive the illusions, you're just making your mind ready to remember that light, which is beyond description. May I ask you something? Many years ago, when I first came across the Course, I'd been reading Yogananda. And I remember at the beginning of my book, I brought it along today for some reason, but it's this
statement that he made that really kind of blew my mind. The spirit was one. By the law of duality, it became two, positive and negative. Then by the law of infinity applied to the law of relativity, it became many. Now the one is endeavoring to unite the many and make them one. And I felt that my whole journey with the Force was that. And I still read it. I put it aside for months and then I pick it up again. Um, it's a precious gift. Yes. But it does say at the end that you need to do nothing. Yes, how beautiful. That you need to do nothing in the sense that you are what you are and you always remain perfect. And that's the good news. That's what the, the New Testament was just coming along. Jesus was saying, you can't die. Uh, he did a little skit at the end of his life, a little crucifixion and resurrection skit. It kind of, it's a little uh, play, you know, kind of like, I can't possibly convey the whole thing to you, but I'm going to put a little skit on uh, to show you that you can't die. And uh, and that's what I, I mean, that's, the, that's where the joy comes from. Uh, when I, years ago, I was, I worked at a hospice, and all the doctors and the nurses loved me. Because they said, you breathe in here like there's no death. Uh, you know, like, you go around and you're laughing and, and having fun with all these uh, patients that are seeing me on their last days or whatever. And then the patients would always would call me in and we'd have these exciting little conversations about go to the light, you're perfectly innocent, uh, don't hang on, you didn't do anything wrong, you, you know, you're perfectly loved. Then they would check out, uh, they did little encounters with me and they'd check out, I had a high checkout rate. <laughs> Instead of uh, healing the sick and raising the dead, I, I, I cleared out hospice. <laughs> because it's all about innocence. It's not about a body hanging on for a couple more uh, days or hours. You know, it's, it's about recognizing divine innocence. In fact, there was a, a Course in Miracles teacher one time. I was, I was doing the dishes, I think, and I was listening to a tape from a Course in Miracles teacher. And, and they asked the teacher, they said, uh, what does the Course say about uh, life on other planets? And uh, the teacher said, the Course says that there's no life on this planet. <laughs> and uh, I remember, I, I was like, wow. <laughs> First time I heard that one for a while. But, but what it's teaching is, is that biology, as we know it, you know, a body that's born and that ages and grows old and dies, that goes for life here. But life is a state of mind. I mean, if, if you're not happy and joyful, it's like you're kind of one of the walking zombies, <laughs> you know, like one of those uh, uh, old, uh, like the Stepford Wives, or, you know, some of those old movies, you know, where, where, where they just kind of were walking around like robots. Uh, and, and some of you might have seen the, the Matrix, and there's so many great movies that are coming out, it's where it's like all a big act. And the funny thing is, it's like there's six billion bodies every day trying not to die, trying to survive and make it another day. And, and it's all just a big facade, because underneath that, there's one mind that's afraid to live, afraid to recognize the one. And when it's so afraid of the love, then it gets caught up into the matrix or into this act of being a separate body with a separate mind. And at some point, you start to realize that you want to unplug from the matrix. Uh, and that's where the, the many become one, in the sense that your mind becomes very whole and unified. And, oh yes, then it's no worries, mate. Uh, then <laughs> you really can say it with full gusto. <laughs> and you stop worshipping at the altar of death. Yes, yes. You stop Which we do all the So what we do is, you know, initially you start to say, Wait a minute, if I'm a death worshiper, how am I a death worshiper? You start to expose this unconscious belief system that is involves judgment. You know, Jesus said, judge not, lest you be judged. That, that the judge is what the death is. I mean, it, and to reach a state of non-judgment is the resurrection of your own mind. Uh, that you're resurrecting your mind like Jesus uh, did 2,000 years ago. He just said, hey guys, there's a better way here. <laughs> Uh, than judging. Let's try trusting. Let's try trusting our higher power, you know, and that's what does it. So these, I'm so glad you share what you did because it's, it's really beautiful when you can all come together and just have an open, friendly, loving, respectful uh, dialogue on this. And what you find is that there's a lot of assumptions 
and a lot of those things that are believed to be true that aren't actually true. But the more you come together and you start to question those assumptions, the more they dissolve away, and you feel freer and lighter. You know? I was in college for 10 years, and uh, so now the Holy Spirit can use the vocabulary and the things that I seem to learn. And nothing's really taken away. I mean, I don't regret those 10 years of college at all, but I realized that, that when I was in college, I was, I was, the motive for me taking all those classes was for degrees, important jobs, status, you know, all the things, pride, and those kind of things. So those were all ego motivations. And then once you get into the awakening experience, the Holy Spirit can use all your skills and abilities, but they're just aimed at extending love. They're not aimed at uh, puffing up a personality self. It's actually, they, they're aimed at dissolving away that personality self. So uh, what you find you're left with is a state of uh, non-attachment. Um, I was talking earlier today about, I was in uh, Columbia, and there was a, a college professor who who was very new to the course, and uh, she really wanted to translate one of my gatherings, even though we had had a professional translator and a woman who had flown all the way in from all the saints and mystics have said it's an inside job. And when we have things like wars uh, that seem to be erupting in the world of form, that's just an opportunity for forgiveness. Uh, the first Gulf War back in the early 90s, I remember I was I was at the Foundation for A Course in Miracles, and we were we were doing a seminar on forgiveness. And all week, everybody had their anger and rage coming up around some. Some people were angry at Saddam Hussein. Some people were angry at George Bush. Some people were angry at the media and the way that the media was portraying the whole thing. And so, variously, as we went through this Course in Miracles seminar, everybody was getting really angry at something. And one woman sat there the whole week very detached, very blissful, did not buy the bait or anything. And then the last day of the seminar, she saw a, a bird covered in oil, and she lost it, just absolutely <laughs> lost it. Like this poor, innocent bird that had nothing to do with this war. And she, she got angry at, at all human beings <laughs> for, for, you know, having this bird, you know, killed with all this oil. But see, that was just another version of projecting the problem. And, and really what of Course of Miracles is just saying is, you've got to recognize that your belief in your own mind, in separation, the ego belief, is where the war is. And it's where the anger is. And only the ego gets angry. But as long as you identify your mind with the ego, guess who seems to get angry? You. But it's not the real you. It's just sleeping you that's identified with the ego. So this is why it's important not to, to stuff your anger and stuff your rage. It's important not to stuff your feelings because those feelings need to get triggered and need to come up. And it's okay to feel that anger when you're watching the TV or whatever, but it's also okay to turn it over to the Holy Spirit and go, I need another way to look at this because I, I, I want happiness in my life. I don't want to hang on and harbor this, this hurt and this anger. So that's what this is really about. It's about not protecting those feelings and emotions. Not going around and pretending, you know, well, a good Course in Miracles student never gets irritated or angry. I mean, if you, if you get into a state of denial uh, and you try to control your behaviors, but emotionally you're still torn up on the inside, it's much better to be more honest with yourself and to let those emotions come up. And even though Jesus says in the Course, anger is never justified, meaning, you know, when you feel angry, don't try to get into justifying it and blaming and, you know, going down that, that whole tangent. But what he is saying is, is that as you do the Course, you will seem to get angry. You will have a lot of emotions that will get flushed up. And that's okay. That's, you shouldn't think that you're not doing the Course properly uh, if these emotions are getting flushed up. And initially, the Holy Spirit will use those contrasts. You know, you have miracle experiences, and then you have these yucky feelings. And it's very uh, difficult, because that's what a split mind does. It's, it swings back and forth between bliss and, and yuck. Until you are able to transcend the ego, and then you, the yuck is gone. So you're just letting the spiritual vibration in you 
yourself grow stronger and stronger and stronger. Your, it's self-love in the truest way. Uh, it's not narcissistic in any way, because we're not talking about the personality stuff. You're just, you're, you know, love thy neighbor as thyself. You know, you're really coming to love yourself. And you're coming to a purity of thought. You know how Jesus said, blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. All you're doing is you're purifying your heart. You're letting go of false desires, of, of judgments, of grievances, of stereotypical thinking. You just clean your mind up from all that stuff. Then, your vibration, your spirit vibration, seems to grow stronger and stronger, like you're hitting the note. You have a nice, high, a beautiful note that you're bringing more consistently. Then you start to attract people into your awareness that are, that are reflective of that note that you're bringing. So it's very empowering. Uh, as you start to feel loving, you start to draw more and more loving witnesses into your life. And when you find one that's not so loving, it's just reflecting a doubt thought about yourself. If you still doubt that you're the Christ, uh, guess who's going to act it out? <laughs> Somebody. <laughs> Somebody's going to show up after you get all these loving witnesses and one shows up. Where did you come from? Uh, it was just another hidden doubt thought about yourself being pure love, about yourself being the Christ. And so you learn to line up with the Holy Spirit and realize that that's a call for love. That if you are love, that if someone comes up like that, it doesn't seem to be uh, very loving. They're just calling for love. And guess who really is calling for love? Mm -hmm. It's yourself taking the form of seemingly somebody else. So instead of perceiving them as insulting you, as attacking you, as taking your peace away, you perceive them as the Holy Spirit as just calling for love. And you extend the love to them, and you feel great, because it just is reinforcing that you have the love and that you are the love. You can't give something away that you don't have. So if you perceive a call for love and you give it away, then that's going to wash away that doubt thought. That's just another washing away of so, it gets more intense as you go deeper in your mind. And there's a section in the self versus self concept section of the Course that says, the role of the accuser will appear in many forms, and it will seem to be accusing you. But have no fear, it will go at last. As long as you're doubting your own self as the Christ, of course the role of the accuser is going to show up. It may be mom or dad, it may be your sibling, your child, your grandparent, it could be uh, it could be at a Course in Miracles group where somebody will stand up and say, you don't know what you're talking about. You're full of it. Uh, you should go home and read this page of this chapter or whatever. It doesn't matter where the role of the accuser comes from. Uh, it's still just an opportunity to extend love. 